Great, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so first, I know I just had an introduction, but I'll give sort of my version of it. So this is just who I am. So this is where I work, in Jena. Um, I'm originally from Canada. Um, I've been in Germany for 11 years, so I'm like German, sort of. But, and if you see the flag down there, it always makes me happy to be at ESA because you have all the European flags and the Canadian flag, because we're an associate member. So, um, I did my PhD in Canada on the optical properties of aerosol particles. I spent a lot of time doing field measurements on ships and in aircraft, and I also did some modeling and worked it into a DCM. And during that time, I, I threw up a lot because of this. I'm not good on flying through clouds. And so I became a modeler. Um, and I also changed fields somewhat, which I'm just mentioning, not that I'm encouraging anyone to change fields, but it is possible. You don't have to stay in one specialization your entire life. So I moved to Germany in 2007. Uh, for a two-year postdoc, working in inverse modeling of greenhouse gases, which I'd never done before. And then I didn't leave. So this is also sometimes how life works. Um, and slowly I started specializing in using remote sensing measurements for this, and this is sort of my niche. Um, it's kind of on a project-related basis, and this is kind of an upcoming data stream in carbon science, so there's quite a, a lot of new and exciting work to do. And I have two kids which isn't that relevant here, but I'm mentioning it because there are not a lot of women who do what I do, and I just thought I would mention it to young scientists, that it is possible. All right, so that was my political aside. So we've already seen a lot of the graphs at the beginning because we're getting a kind of an overview of carbon cycle science, which we saw already this morning. But I think some repetition is not altogether bad, especially for people who are not working in this field directly. So this is why we care about carbon dioxide. Um, as you can see, it's gone up quite a lot in the last century or so. Um, and what's quite interesting, this, this uh, graph goes to 2005. And if we were to extend it to 2018, we would definitely still fit on the x-axis, but we'd actually have to extend the y-axis because it's gone up that much in the 10 years since this graph was made. So we're now well over 400 parts per million for carbon dioxide. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are also important, but today I'm going to try and focus on carbon dioxide. Tomorrow I'll get more into methane, which is, you know, also quite important and mysterious. And this is, of course, from this year's, or the, most, the more recent uh, IPCC assessment report, why we care about carbon dioxide. This is all very obvious to you guys, but I think it still merits a mention that... Hold on a second. Yeah, this part at least works. Um, this is the temperature anomaly versus the cumulative total anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And in black is where we have actual measurements, and then the other colored lines are different emission scenarios going into the future. They all go into the year 2100. But if we emit lots and lots and lots, we end up here at four and a half degrees. And if we kind of are very, very, very good as a society, we end up just under two degrees. And these are sort of showing that it really matters how much carbon dioxide ends up in the atmosphere and how much we emit to what the temperature anomaly is going to be. And I mentioned there how much we emit versus how much ends up in the atmosphere because it's not quite the same. And again, we've seen the Mauna Loa curve already today, but it is, as, as Sean said this morning, it's one of the most important graphs that we have in our field. And this was the first record that we had that atmospheric carbon dioxide was changing in these early measurements. Not just changing with the, the annual cycle, the seasonal cycle that we see here, but also increasing. And there's an enormous amount of information packed into this graph. So you can see slightly here that some parts it sort of flattens out a little bit, sometimes it's going up more steeply. And this interannual variability tells us a lot about what's going on at the surface of the Earth. So this is the internal variability in the growth rate, just from Mauna Loa, from this one fairly remote site in Hawaii. And you see that it captures a large degree of the, the internal variability in atmospheric CO2, which we need to understand the carbon dioxide budget. And again, from the Global Carbon Project, um, or this is from the IPCC, but it's the same plot, um, we saw this earlier as well. So this is our anthropogenic emissions, our fossil fuel and land use. And land use is, there's some error bars on that. But what is important here is that the most variable of these two are the light blue and the green. And the light blue 
is the airborne fraction. And this we can measure well. This we can measure with great precision. This we can measure from one station in Hawaii pretty well to get this, this variability. Uh, something went strange with my font there. And this is the land sink. And this changes a lot from year to year, and it's very difficult to measure this change year to year directly. Um, there are a lot of missions, like biomass that's going to be trying to estimate the reservoir that's growing above land. Um, however, measuring these, these short-term changes, this internal variability, is very difficult, and measuring what's going on in the atmosphere is a way to do it sort of indirectly, and it's much easier to do. I also want to mention, as already said, so about 45% or so of our emissions, everything, the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere stays there. This number has remained suspiciously constant over the past century or so. We don't really have a good explanation for why it has to be 45%. And at some point, the sinks may stop working with the same efficacy as they are right now, and this may not be 45% in the future. And this is one of the big risks, sort of with the carbon, cl carbon climate feedbacks, that if our land sink and our ocean sink start to shut down, then all of this is going to be happening faster. More of the carbon emitted will stay in the atmosphere. And models, land surface models, disagree greatly in projections about how that's going to look over the next 100 years. And this is partly why we do what we do. We don't want to just know with great precision what the concentration is everywhere. We want to then deduce the fluxes from this and then compare it to our process knowledge of what's going on at the land surface so that we can actually improve our projections because this is a very uncertain step. So that's kind of like the big question for why we're doing this. But yeah, so as I said, we already know this from Mauna Loa, so why do we need all these extra measurements? Well, suppose we had just two measurements. So now we have Mauna Loa and this red line is at the South Pole in Antarctica. And we already heard this morning about, you know, we expect that there's going to be minima sort of, it's going to be decreasing during the growing season and it increases during the, the winter, the northern hemisphere winter. And of course, the southern hemisphere has a different seasonal cycle, which you can see here. At some places, it's easier to see than others. So we see that it's completely out of phase, which we expect. Does anybody notice anything else about the curves? How do the seasonal cycles compare, for instance? it's much smaller, right? And this is mostly because there's not a lot of land in the Southern Hemisphere compared to the Northern Hemisphere. So the land biosphere is what's driving the really big seasonal cycle. So that's already some information, but what I find most interesting about this, and that's because I'm an inverse modeler, so that's what I do. Um, if you look back in 1960, they were, their average was about the same, right? And now there's a decent offset between it. So it's like the growth rate in the, at the South Pole is less than the growth rate at Mauna Loa. Why? Because all the carbon's gone, it gets sucked up somewhere. <laughs> Any guesses? It's okay if you don't guess. <laughs> so, hmm? I, I didn't totally understand that, but I think it, I heard words that sounded right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm losing yeah. my voice. Um, is it to do with like, hemispheric transport of where pollutants are emitted from? Yes, absolutely. So there's interhemispheric transport. Most of the emissions are coming from where most of the people live and where most of the land is. So they're coming from the northern hemisphere. So the, this acceleration happens in the northern hemisphere first, and it takes a little while for that signal to show up in the southern hemisphere. And as this growth rate has been increasing, so as the slope gets bigger, I am terrible at this, as the slope increases, then the difference between them increases as well. Because it kind of, it takes a few months, at least, for the air to kind of to get from one side to the other, more than a few months, really. But yeah, so that's really the interhemispheric transport. The interhemispheric transport hasn't slowed down, which one could deduce from this, but rather the emissions have increased. So, so already we see there's all more information when you have two measurement sites. And so the, the basic scientific questions that kind of drive what we're doing is what are the main feedback processes between the carbon cycle and the climate system? Can we estimate the budget of a specific region? And then where and by what processes is carbon taken up and released? So 
This is where we bring in inverse modeling. And I'm going to talk about this more on Wednesday, but this is just kind of like the very cartoon version of what we're doing. So suppose we have two measurement sites. These are actually cartoons of flux measurement sites, but pretend that they're atmospheric concentration measurement sites. So suppose we have these two, and we have wind blowing roughly from one station to the other, and there's a factory in the middle. And we measure here 400 ppm. That's parts per million. So for every million molecules of, of air, 400 of them are carbon dioxide. And over here, we're measuring 410 parts per million. OK. So now if we know the wind speed and something about how dispersive the air is, like how mixed up it gets along the way, we can estimate the emissions. So I'm not doing this with math, but this is the idea. OK. So far, so good. So if we had more measurements, then we can get more information about where the fluxes are happening. So emissions are just positive fluxes. Fluxes can go into the ground or out of the ground. So now suppose we have some more stuff in between, and it's sunny. Then we have here 400 parts per million, and over here we have 400 parts per million. And so this kind of shows you that maybe we need more information. Luckily, we know roughly where, where factories are. We know roughly where forests are. So this is kind of our prior information, what we knew in advance. What hap what's happening here is the emissions are still happening, but there's also uptake by the land biosphere in between. So this, provides, this gives us a, a bit more difficulty to really constrain the individual components. But if we had another measurement station, the answer is always more measurements. Um, then we can actually resolve this and get into the features of what's driving the different processes. This is why measurement density really matters. And so coming to measurement density, this is roughly what the current observational constraints look like for surface-based stations. And it changes slightly from year to year, but it gives you the idea. Um, these are stations that have more than, I think, five years of data that have to be a long enough record to use. And you'll see that there's some really big gaps for some really interesting areas that have lots of fluxes. So this is not optimal. And this is what adding one satellite did to it. So this is GOSAT measurements. GOSAT is a Japanese satellite. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But here you can see that it fills in a lot of the gaps and gives you some idea about the gradients. What you also see is that there's still gaps in the tropics, and this is where there's persistently cloudy regions. If you have measurements that need reflected sunlight, then you need cloud-free conditions, and there are some places where, unfortunately, it is not all that often cloud-free. Because you need sunlight, you also don't end up with very many measurements during the winter. So if we look at the winter in Europe, say, so we're springtime, summer, lots and lots of measurements. And already in October, December, there's almost nothing. OK, if you're interested in the land biosphere, maybe that doesn't matter so much, but it still sort of matters. Um, so you end up with kind of a, a change in sampling over the year. Um, you'll notice also that this ocean section goes up and down. This is an ocean glint measurement. So the, the satellite's actually looking at the spot that is most bright, where the sun is reflecting off the, the ocean. And so this also moves up and down with the solar zenith angle. So, but it still shows you that we're getting some additional information, at least some additional spatial coverage. But does that, is it really enough? Oh, I hope this works. Is it enough to really resolve what we think is going on in the atmosphere? So this is a simulation from NASA, and this is a seven kilometer model. And this is a forward run. This does not have really real data in it, but it gives you an idea of the variability that we expect. It does have reasonable meteorological data, um, and it has sort of models running forward for the fluxes. But you see that there's massive variability, and the transport really, really matters. So this is why we can't just ignore the transport and pretend we have wind going from one direction to another. So the color scale here, it's probably a bit hard to read. This is the column integrated carbon dioxide concentration. And you'll see that it ranges over a pretty, well, I can barely read the numbers on here. Um, so from this kind of green color up to here, this is only about 10 ppm. So 10 out of roughly 400. So it gives you an idea of how small these signals are. These are pretty small signals. Um, the white here is just a carbon monoxide because it gives you an idea of where things are burning. 
So here, we're getting into the beginning of the growing season. We're in May right now. So this is the beginning of the growing season in the Northern Hemisphere. We still have high concentrations up here because it's just now that we're getting the uptake. And as the summer goes on, you'll see that the low values start up here, and then the interhemispheric gradient changes. So here we're seeing the uptake starting to pick up. We're getting more and more uptake. We're in June, so now we're pretty much at the solstice. And these little flashes down here are where there's burning. And so here you see this is the northern hemisphere sucking up all the carbon that it can during its peak growing season. We're getting higher concentrations down here, but they will never be as high because you just don't have as much um, vegetation or as much uh, emissions. So it gives you an idea of how complex it is and why we need to really have more measurements to resolve this fully, even if we know the transport well, which is arguable. So. All right. So the satellites, I've already shown some data from GOSAT, and this is an Earth observation summer school at ESA, so I'm talking a little bit about how the, the remote sensing measurements work. But if anybody here is really doing remote sensing retrievals or instrumentation, this is really just scratching the surface. Okay. So these are kind of different methodologies for remote sensing. So the first one is kind of a ground-based sensor that's looking directly at the sun. Um, this is used in a variety of things. I'm, there's so many acronyms in remote sensing that I can't avoid using them all together. But uh, so TCON and NDAC are both ground-based remote sensing networks that are trying to measure atmospheric composition from the ground. I'm just going to pretend like they're words and not tell you what they all stand for. Um, another option is looking at uh, thermal emission. So this is like looking at the black body radiation of something. You can look at the black body radiation of the Earth. You can look at the black body radiation of the air directly even. Um, and me measurements that do this are IAZI and AIRS and TESS. These are different satellites. These are used a lot for meteorological measurements because it gives you something information about temperature and moisture sort of at the same time. Um, but you can also, if you assume you know the temperature and moisture well enough, you can extract information about greenhouse gases as well. And I'll talk later about why we don't use those so much for this application. And this is kind of the main one that we're using right now. Um, this is passive remote sensing, so it's using the light of the sun that's then reflecting and scattering off of the Earth's surface and things in the atmosphere. And this is sort of the main greenhouse gas measuring satellites that exist now or have existed. So things like Skiamaki, GOSAT, OCO2, Sentinel-5P, and if those words don't mean anything to you, I'm sorry, but it's only an hour, so. <laughs> um, and then finally, the another option is active remote sensing, uh, which then has its own radiation source. And there's currently no greenhouse gas measuring systems that have this. However, um, there's an airborne version that measures, well, a few airborne versions that measure carbon dioxide and methane, and Merlin, which is a German-French satellite, will be launching in 2022 that does this for methane, so I'll talk about this more in terms of methane. Ascends is a long-running prototype that NASA has been working on that may never end up in space, but maybe it will. So. And also, for people who work in remote sensing, but perhaps not in the exact same field, just to explain how I use these terms, because sometimes it changes a little bit. Um, we talk about L0, L1, L2, L3, L4, okay? So L0 is what's measured directly on the satellite. This is like photon counts, voltages, this is the actual measurement. And then this is converted to spectra. So if you have optics that say this wavelength band falls onto this sensor and this gives me this, voltage, then it tells me I had this many photons, and this means this for the spectrum that I'm seeing in space. So spectra already means something that's closer to a geophysical parameter. Um, but then what we're really interested in is the column average abundances, which we call that this X means averaged across the column. So XCO2 or XCH4. Um, so that's what L2 is. And this step from here, from L1 to L2, in our field, we usually call a retrieval. And then this step from L2 to L4, which is like the same kind of mathematical problem, but instead going from these concentration measurements to fluxes, so L2 to L4 we call an inversion. They're mathematically very similar, 
just with different forward models and different priors. But this is why I'm mentioning this, because sometimes if you end up with talking to people who work at this step, they also call it inversion, and there's no reason why they shouldn't, and it leads to much confusion. So I've had some conversations that didn't make any sense because of this. Um, and then there's also L3 data, which are gap-filled maps, um, which I like to think of as pretty pictures. I, in my applications, I don't use them really for science, but some, depending what you're doing, they can be easier to interpret because they don't have not a numbers or zeros all over the place. Um, but they end up mixing sort of real measurements with some sort of modeled interpretation or Krieging or whatever you're using to fill the gaps. Yeah. And so just to say the retrieval, oh, I'll come to that in a second. Um, this is the rough idea of where we're measuring things in the near infrared. This is uh, for GOSAT, but there, there's only subtle differences from instrument to instrument. So there's different bands. There's sort of two main absorption bands for carbon dioxide. One's at about 1.6 microns, one's at about 2 microns. And there's oxygen at about 0.76 microns. There's the oxygen A band. Um, and by looking at the, the, the absorption in these areas, you get information not only on the gases themselves, but also a broadband characterization of aerosol because things like aerosol scattering tend to have a broad spectrum effect, whereas the gas absorption is happening at really specific wavelengths. And why do you care about aerosol? Okay, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, so this is roughly how retrievals work in a very hand-wavy sense. But, so it's a form of optimal estimation. So it's something where you have to solve a problem to get the best answer. So the forward model in this case is a radiative transfer model. So we've already heard some about radiative transfer models today. So this is a radiative transfer model that says if the sun is here and it's going through the atmosphere, bouncing off this surface, going back through the atmosphere, and is measured up here, what do we expect the spectrum to be? Okay. So we start with a prior estimate of what we think the atmosphere looks like. So this can, is usually from a model, but it's sort of what you think the temperature profile looks like, what you think the water vapor profile looks like, what you think the carbon dioxide looks like. And then you create a spectra based on this, okay? So this is based on the state of the atmosphere. And then you compare the spectra to what the satellite sees, and you adjust the concentrations and other things that you've put into your state vector until you can minimize the mismatch. The mismatch is called the residual. So you wanna try and get your modeled spectra to look ex close to the measured spectra as you can. And this is where you get the optimal estimation. This can be done with Bayesian methods, and it's, you could just change like 10 words in here and it's exactly the same as atmospheric inversion. So it's the same kind of problem. And I mentioned aerosols before, and this is why they matter. So this is what we want to have happen. We want the sun to come down, bounce off the earth, and go up to our satellite. This is like the ideal case. What often happens is there is either aerosol particles or maybe thin cirrus clouds that don't block all the light, but kind of mess up the light so that this is what actually happens. And this is bad, because it means we don't know the path length of our light. And if you don't know how much atmosphere it passes through, then all you can say is it, it passed by roughly this many molecules of carbon dioxide. But was it this many molecules to the surface and back, or was it this many molecules with an extra long or an extra short journey? And this creates a lot of errors. This creates systematic errors. So most of the, the retrieval methods try and solve for aerosols in some way as well. This is why they're trying to get the additional aerosol parameters. So aerosols and cirrus, I, I don't think this is too controversial, it might be an overstatement, but are the single biggest source of error due to path length uncertainties. Um, there are other sources of error, but these ones are pretty important. All right, so historically, I'm gonna start with Skiamaki, and I actually tell you what this acronym means. It's a terrible acronym. It's Scanning Imaging Absorption Spectrometer for Atmospheric Chartography. And Skiamaki actually is a word, which I only learned after working with the data for about five years. And it means shadow boxing, or sort of fighting an invisible opponent, which is kind of appropriate for measuring air. So, yeah. Um, if anybody speaks Greek, apparently it comes from Greek. But it, the word exists in English. Uh, so it was launched in 2002 on board Envisat. So this is a European satellite. There were other, Envisat was a monster satellite. There were other 
measurements on there as well, so MIPA is among other things. And it operated until 2012, and that was when Envisat lost power slash communication with the Earth. Um, the team in Bremen, John Burroughs, will tell you that if Envisat ever gets power back, he's confident that Skiamaki is still operating. <laughs> but, <laughs> so. um, it had relatively large ground pixels. They were about 30 kilometers by 60 kilometers at nadir, so looking straight down at its smallest. This is pretty big compared to what we usually have today. And a very broad swath, so about 1,000 kilometers. And it could measure a lot of species. It measured everything. Um, but it was the first time the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, were attempted from space. So this was kind of showing that it could be done at all. Um, this gives you an idea of how much it was measuring, um, different species that could be retrieved in some way, and then which bands they were using. So there was, there was sort of the different absorption bands. And you see carbon dioxide and methane are both here, and they were both using things out around two microns. Um, yeah, if you, what happened then in the future is they realized how hard a problem greenhouse gases were and then focused instruments more on one or two of these gases because it's a difficult problem. Now, this is something called the averaging kernel. If you're working with satellite data, it's good to keep in mind. We're very lucky that with, at these particular wavelengths, the averaging kernel is relatively flat. So this is one, these are sort of normalized averaging kernels, and they stay relatively flat, and if anything, they're more heavily weighted towards the surface. I'm sorry, these lines are so skinny. Uh, it's for different solar zenith angles. So you get some more deviation at very high solar zenith angles where you don't get much data anyhow. Um, this is good. It's good that our averaging kernels are flat or peaking towards the surface because it gives you more sensitivity in the lower atmosphere. The lower atmosphere is where our fluxes are happening. We're interested in the land atmosphere exchange. And so we want to be able to see this part of the atmosphere. There are other measurements that peak higher up that see the upper troposphere more or even the lower stratosphere. And that's interesting if you're monitoring the stratosphere, but it's more difficult to interpret if you're interested in surface fluxes and it's more prone to transport errors. Basically, there's more things that can go wrong when you say, I have high concentrations up here, and I think they came from over here a month ago. There are many, many more things that can go wrong. And to give an idea um, why we're not using so much the thermal infrared sensors, this is roughly the averaging kernel for Skiamaki for OCO, which is a NASA satellite. And this is for AIRS or IAZI. And you see they peak around sort of 300, 400 hectopascals. So this is really the upper troposphere. So this is quite high from the, the surface. So this is more difficult to measure, um, to, to interpret, and they have very little sensitivity at the surface. So this is back to Skiamaki. You have a nice decade of space-borne data. We call these the, the magic carpet plots, where you see the, the northern hemisphere uh, seasonal cycle and the southern hemisphere seasonal cycle that's smaller and off phase. And it looks great. There was more data coverage. This is kind of like an interpretation of the uh, level three kind of data. Um, unfortunately, things got really wonky here. After about 2007, it got really bad. But even after 2005, in methane due to sensor degradation, um, it was the kind of sensor that was being used that was badly affected by cosmic rays. But Skiamaki was just the beginning. And this is a very busy table, but it's kind of a nice summary. And so here we have the year, and this is more or less up to date. Um, I, I wiggled the bars around to make sure that it was kind of correct now. And you see, so Skiamaki, a European mission, was the first. It was measuring carbon dioxide and methane. And here we are, is right where the operating and planned lines meet. Right now, there's four satellites on orbit that are theoretically measuring um, carbon dioxide, at least, or, or methane, sorry. They're all measuring methane, and three, uh, one's only measuring carbon, half and half. Um, I say theoretically because so far there's very little data coming out of TANSAT um, that is shared with the rest of the world. This is a Chinese satellite, and they've started sharing their level one data, the spectra, but their level two data are, it, it's a work in progress. So, and there's actually a group from ESA who's working to 
work on data agreements and data sharing agreements. Um, yeah, because if we can't use the data, then there's no iteration and no improvement. And so it's good for everyone if the data are, are uh, shared. Um, normally, I try and have these, the lines are in order, but these, this got launched earlier than schedule, which is, never happens, but that, this happened in China. And normally, these bars just get shoved, shoved this way because things always are later than you expect. But what you can see is over the next years, so this goes up to sort of 2023 20, or 2020, yeah, that we're expecting an increasing number of satellites, so there's going to be an actual sort of constellation in orbit of different sensors. And this kind of provides new opportunities, but also new problems, because you have to characterize their error and how they work together. So, ah, and these gray things here that just make it look messy, is gives a, a graphical representation of their instantaneous field of view, so how big their pixels are on the ground. And yeah. I will go through that again for the sensors I'm gonna talk about today. So this is Skiomaki, this big orange box. And then to scale roughly, to, this is like a PowerPoint presentation, so don't interpret it too hard, but this is one GOSAT footprint. So you see already that the footprint was getting significantly smaller. And this is good for a few reasons, mostly because of cloud cover. You need to have smaller gaps in your clouds then. The smaller your footprint, the more measurement yield you get. And OCO2, they're actually parallelograms and not ovals, but bear with me. Um, this is a swath that's eight kilometers across, and so then the satellite's actually flying in this direction, and this is the full width of the swath. So it's kind of like a pencil strip with very high resolution in this little skinny swath. And then uh, Tropomi, which is on Sentinel-5P, this is measuring methane, and it has a massive swath, so 2,600 kilometer swath, and it's a it's moving along like this, and it was planned to have a seven by seven kilometer field of view, but once they got up there, they had more light than they expected, and so it might be now three and a half by seven. I'm not 100% sure what the final value was. And this is actually something where it makes so many measurements that the computation does matter. Like this morning when everyone was saying, oh, we all have fast computers, it matters for this. So they realized they, had, they could actually increase the spatial resolution. They said, oh, geez, I'm not sure we can actually process all of these retrievals because it's, it's that much data. And this is sort of a proposed mission that I'll talk about in a moment. This is um, a proposed Sentinel-7 carbon mission and that will be two by two kilometers and about a 200 kilometer swath. So it's similar to OCO2 in spatial coverage, but much, much wider. That just gives an idea of how the instruments sort of stack up spatially. And here you see that before I showed GOSAT data, this is OCO2 data. And you see that there's even better and more continuous data coverage, um, partly because they're doing glint measurements over land as well. But uh, yeah, smaller footprint means that there's more measurements under cloudy conditions. And also, GOSAT was sort of looking at one spot then looking at another spot, and the spots were a few hundred kilometers apart. And OCO2 is measuring essentially continuously across its skinny band and along its orbit. So we actually have a lot of data to work with now. There's still some problems with the data, but we have data. So, and to see what this looks like at higher resolution and the kind of new information that we get from the higher resolution, it's not just to see between the clouds. This is a nice study from, from Ray Nasser from last year. And this is, gives you an idea of what one eight kilometer strip of OCO2 data looks like over land. And this is a, a power plant down here. So this is eight kilometers um, wide swath. And this is a power plant. And if you use your imagination somewhat, you can see that there's, the wind is going in this direction. There's higher values here, okay? So we can actually see the, swath, or the, the plume coming from an individual power plant. This is very cool. I'm just turning it around for, for reference sake. Um, it makes it a bit easier to interpret these. So this is the observed plume. And then this can be fit to a very simple Gaussian plume model to estimate what the emissions are. And they were able to do this for five power plants worldwide and came within one to 17% of reported emissions. Now for these power plants, we already had a pretty good idea of what the emissions were, but this is kind of a proof of concept for measuring point sources for where you don't have a good idea of what the emissions are. And this is exciting because this is the first time that we're actually going after anthropogenic emissions directly. 
So generally speaking, on the global scale and on bigger spatial scales, anthropogenic fluxes are more well-constrained than biospheric fluxes. So usually we think that we know how much fossil fuels we're burning way better than we know what's going on with the, the, the forests, okay? However, these are really well-constrained, or fairly well-constrained, on the national scale, and the uncertainties in this budget changes from country to country. Um, and they also get much more uncertain in terms of distribution within the country. So maybe you have a number for Russia, and you trust this number for Russia. Russia is a big place, and you kind of want to know where is this happening. And if you're able to map the concentrations in space, Russia is a bad example because it's really far north, so not a lot of sunlight, but then you get more information. So going back to this that we saw before, the different parts of the budget, some of these are more certain than others. So we get sort of more uncertain is the idea as we go from anthropogenic fluxes to ocean and then land was sort of the most uncertain. So we've always used, in inverse modeling, we use the anthropogenic fluxes as our anchor. We say, yeah, okay, we trust this, we're gonna pre-subtract it, but this is becoming less true. So, so our known anthropogenic emissions are becoming more uncertain. And this is similar to, to what we've seen earlier. Um, this is the share from different countries and how it's changing over time from 1990 to 2013. And we see that the share that's by, from China, other big developing countries, other non-Annex 1 countries, is getting bigger. And this also means that this, the part that's less certain is getting bigger. And because of this, we lose our anchor. So as we lose our anchor, we have to work at doing a better job of trying to solve for anthropogenic as well as biogenic fluxes simultaneously. And for this, spatial resolution really matters. So imagine what we could do if we had something like OCO2 but with a wider swath. So this is a model simulation. We don't have anything that can measure like this yet. But this is a, was a support study for a Sentinel-7 candidate mission that looks at total column CO2 um, around Berlin. And the idea, the plan for this mission is to have something like a 250 kilometer or so swath. And then you actually see, yeah, okay, we could break it down into not just what are the fluxes over this big grid box, but what are the fluxes from Berlin, the city, versus this power plant over here, Jenschwalde, versus Schwarze Pumpe, Boxberg, the, dif init the different point sources. And then you can look at this separated from the background fluxes. So, yeah, this is a proposed Sentinel-7 mission, um, planning to launch a constellation of imager satellites, and this is sort of a joint work between the European Commission and ESA. So, the idea is that the information will fall, flow into the stock take for the 2028 stock take um, as part of sort of the Paris Agreement. Okay, all the satellites I've talked about so far are in low Earth orbit. They're also all in polar orbit, sun-synchronous polar orbit, mostly because we need the sun, yeah? And it also, you end up with less problems if you pass over the same place on Earth every time at the same day, so you always have the same sun angles at the same time of year. Um, there are problems, though, that there's, as I, as I showed before, lots of gaps in the persistently cloudy and scientifically interesting tropics. And so some have suggested looking at geostationary orbits to, to try and solve this problem. So geostationary orbit is much higher up, about 37,000 kilometers, and it just sits there and looks down. Um, there's a NASA mission that's been approved, GeoCARB, that wants to do this over the Americas, and there's a proposal for an Earth Explorer 10 mission over Africa. If you wanna know more about that, please feel free to ask me. And this is sort of what GeoCARB would do. So in this figure, you can see what OCO2 swaths look like. So again, this is eight kilometers across. And here you have this slit in the north-south direction. And the, the footprint's a little bit bigger. It's kind of more like five to 10 kilometers. But then it moves across the box. So this box would take about um, 1.8 hours to scan. This box would take 2.3 hours to scan. And then you can change the measurement plans a little bit to say we want to get the diurnal cycle of North America. So maybe you could scan North America four times in a day, at least three times in a day, or if you want to focus on the Amazon. And so this is sort of the idea to try and say maybe if it's less cloudy, we'll try and get as many measurements in the tropics as we can. So this is something that's coming. It's a new type of data that we have to learn how to work with. There are still some problems. There's always some problems. Um, our measurement precision has improved over time from Skiamaki to GOSAT to OCO2. We're down so that the single measurement precision is something like half a ppm, 
which is really good, right? We're looking at a signal that's around 400 ppm background, and we're looking at like less than 0.2% is our, our precision. This is something very hard to do from space. So we're looking at small signals. But there are still some systematic biases that remain. So systematic errors in the sense meaning that they're correlated with something in space or time. If it's a random error, we don't mind so much. If it's Gaussian and it's noisy and it cancels out, then we can interpret the data still quite well. But if there are systematic errors that after averaging are still there, we think it's a signal and we interpret it as such. So some errors we've already been able to remove. Some are related to spectroscopy. Um, so that you know the HITRAN database wasn't sufficient and people had to go back to the lab and relearn how to do spectroscopy. Um, aerosol and serous contamination, as already mentioned. Uh, BRDF, which is like a, a yeah, remote sensing thing that has to do with the angle of light and it's not truly Lambertian, so it scatters differently in different directions depending upon the surface. It's a pretty small effect, but still, we're getting into the, the regime where this matters, yeah? And one of the things that we use for this is ground-based remote sensing as sort of our calibration. So we're, we're more certain about this measurement. So this is something like TCON, which is the Total Carbon Column Observing Network um, that was essentially built up as a validation network for OCO2. Um, and all the satellite missions use it. And there's been, for instance, the most recent major correction for OCO2 data um, was related to very slight pointing errors that created a bias not directly related to elevation, but related to elevation change. So that the, the, the two channels weren't looking at exactly the same point. And so when you're going upslope, they, they led to a bias in one direction. And when you're moving downslope, it led to a bias in the other direction. So people saw the error for a while, but it took a while to tease out what exactly the problem was. And then there was another correction, sort of a spectroscopic correction, that led to a very nice and relevant byproduct. And I think we might hear more about this possibly later in the week. Um, solar induced fluorescence. And this is something that kind of comes out of the retrieval now, the way that, we're, that people do retrievals now for um, carbon dioxide. So essentially, the idea with solar induced fluorescence, this is kind of changing topics a bit, but not really, because it's still all carbon cycle related and really relevant for understanding carbon dioxide. Um, not all the photons that make it to the leaf get used for photosynthesis. There's usually too much light. So the plant has different protective mechanisms to try and get rid of it in other ways. So there's like, um, yeah, there's like quenching into heat. And one of the, but the thing that we're very interested in, so this is the only one that's actually doing photosynthesis, the photosystem two. And over here, there's a fluorescence photon. So it actually throws off some of this light at specific wavelengths. So this is kind of the idea of the, the flex mission, which Others in the room can explain much better than me. Um, so plant physiologists have used this so in the lab and in the field for years. Um, they'll often give like a pulse of, of light to a plant and then measure the fluorescence that comes after. And it gives you some idea about the processes inside the plant. It's well correlated with GPP, which is sort of photosynthetic uptake. So the biospheric fluxes that we can measure or deduce from the concentrations is just the sum of the respiration and the photosynthesis terms. And this helps us separate these. Um, from satellite, from the satellites I'm talking about, we can deduce this from the filling in of the Fraunhofer lines, which is a sort of a, a, a signal in the spectrum of the oxygen A band. And just a, a difference in the, ra the ratio spectra with or without SIF shows you where all these lines are. And the, all absorptions are in red, and only the Fraunhofer lines are in blue. And for instance, for Skiamaki, it shows you which channels they were able to use to retrieve. Um, fluorescence. And here there's another one, and here there's another one. And it actually start the people that I work with, at least, they started doing this because otherwise there was errors in their estimation of the greenhouse gases because of these spectral signatures that they were seeing. Um, so Christian Frankenberg was one of the people who worked on this early, and uh, that's kind of mostly what he does now. Um, and this kind of shows you the fluorescence from Fraunhofer lines from GOSAT, and this is strongly correlated to GPP. And this is a model GPP using a machine learning upscaling of flux tower data um, from, well, from my institute, from Martin Jung's group. And so you see that they're quite strongly correlated. So this was seen as quite nice that completely independent estimations of GPP were so strongly correlated that 
it looked like there was really something to it. Um, from GOM2, this is a paper by Luis Guanter et al. And they found that the, the peak CIF and therefore the peak GPP in the world was actually like in the US Corn Belt. And here is the measurements that they had. Um, and this is where they're growing corn crops. And that process-based GPP couldn't actually show this very well. And then the, the upscaling also couldn't reproduce it to the same intensity. So th there's agreement, but not 100%. So it's quite, quite interesting. And this, there's kind of always the argument, like they seem to correlate, but they shouldn't necessarily correlate exactly. But at least on this scale, the scale that we're looking at, the canopy scale, it seems to work quite well. So this is flux tower GPP versus the OCO2 SIF, and it has the best correlation. And this is, again, the upscaled product versus the OCO2, and it falls off a little bit. And this is MODIS GPP, which is another methodology based on um, MODIS measurements, and it has the poorest correlation. So this is really, it, it seems to work rather well, and this gives us additional information. So coming to my conclusion now. So if we're measuring the atmospheric composition of greenhouse gases, CO2 in particular, this is why we're doing it, it helps us to understand rapid fluctuations of the carbon cycle. On the long term, you know, the oceans matter more. On the really long term, the rocks matter more. But on the terms that we're living in, the atmosphere is a really good place to start. So passive remote sensing now, at sort of the state of the art, can measure total, carbon, total column carbon dioxide at high precision. So something like half a ppm, and this is actually pretty great. Um, there are, however, still measurement gaps. This leads to sort of a sampling bias. In the winter, at night, under cloudy conditions. And despite this, we're going to end up with more and more measurements because we're having more and more satellites over the next years. So some systematic errors remain, but it's getting better. It's sort of an ongoing work in progress. And the sun-induced fluorescence relevant for partitioning of the processes driving biospheric fluxes comes more or less for free. Um, it may not be the best fluorescence product, so Flex is specializing in this, but has incredibly small footprint and much less coverage. So for the scales, if we're working on global scales, this is still really relevant information. So, and I think that's everything. Thank you. Any questions? Yep. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, in the framework of using satellite spectral data to constrain emission inventories of either uh, greenhouse gases or emission anthropogenic pollutants, um, would you say that the largest errors, uncertainties, are uh, associated with the conversion of the spectra into column information, which is the retrieval algorithm, mm -hmm or the use of the column information, which is column concentration actually, integrated concentration into emission fluxes. And if that changes from pollutant to pollutant, like some are tracers, some are uh, active uh, photochemically or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, thank um, you. Yeah, this is, <laughs> it probably depends who you ask. But I would say that there's larger uncertainties and more obvious room for improvement at the level two to level four step. So going to the fluxes. This is what I do, and I know everything we do wrong. So maybe if I did level one to level two, I would realize everything that they did wrong and <laughs> would trust it less. Um, and it does matter depending on the chemistry of the tracer. So carbon dioxide is an incredibly long-lived tracer, right? Which is useful, but also difficult in some ways. I mean, if you're measuring NOx from space, then I mean, it's right there. You know, you, you see it, you know that the source is there. You know, the source was very close. Getting to exact ratios maybe is, is difficult. There's uncertainty there, but the transport is less uncertain. And actually, kind of related to that, for the, the mission focusing on anthropogenic flexes, we're kind of pushing to have a, a NOx sensor on board simply to say, yes, this is a fossil fuel plume, as a, as a flag, to say, yeah, for sure, this is coming from fossil emissions and not from something else. So I think it, it does matter. Um, carbon dioxide, when you're measuring at remote sites, you're seeing an integrated signal from a really long way, so the transport gets more and more important. So 
but yeah, I think the biggest errors are still level two to level four. Um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, about the level two uh, CO2 concentration, um, which is the, the width of the column that you consider when you obtain the average uh, value? I mean, uh, it's, mm, it depends about the, uh, the ground-based measurement that you have, or it's something that I'm interested in that maybe just in the uh, tropospheric column, or I wanted to, uh, I mean, it's, ch it's uh, something that is uh, changing, or uh, it's just the uh, tropospheric column that you are going to yeah, so again, it depends on the wavelengths you're using, but in the near infrared, it is an integral across the entire column. So it's seeing the, str the stratosphere and the troposphere with a particular weighting. And this weighting is coming out, this averaging kernel actually comes out of the retrieval and it gives you an idea about what information you have, what levels you have information on. You can't get a profile though. There's not enough degrees of freedom. So there's only about 1.4 to 1.8 degrees of freedom. So this is why we only interpret it as an integrated column. Um, there has been some efforts to try and separate it into two pieces of information, sort of an upper and a lower column, but this is very experimental. I'm not sure if that answered your question entirely. If you're interested in higher up, then um, the mid-infrared to thermal infrared is more, more interesting. So the mid-infrared sensors, like sort of from a ground-based sensor, this would be more like NDAC, it actually gets more information higher up, and depending on the species can also separate more layers, so more degrees of freedom. Okay. Does that help a bit? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, about the precision of the remote sensing measurement, uh, maybe uh, the graph that uh, 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 our uh, everyday showed, <laughs> like uh, the change uh, in mm -hmm. the CO2 emission on the other uh, greenhouse gases, uh, uh, could be uh, different, maybe with the I mean, with the integration of remote sensing based me measurement, uh, could be a change, uh, or I'll maybe with the, that. Uh, it, it doesn't actually change it very much, which was encouraging. Um, so we did plot this up. There was sort of a climate change initiative project with from ESA, and we actually had some nice plots showing, like this is what the Skiamaki total atmosphere looks like. And I mean, of course, you hope that they're in phase and roughly the same size. They, they should be. But of course, the sampling is a little bit different, right? So yeah, you have to compare like with like a little bit. What we've also done is assimilating both of them into atmospheric models and then comparing the total atmospheric burden inferred from ground-based versus total column. And they actually agree quite well, which again, they should, but it's not necessary that that would follow. So this was also encouraging. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, is, it, um, is it essential to have tropospheric sensitivity to, uh, to get surface fluxes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, so that, that's yeah. uh, concerning for my particular project. <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm trying to retrieve a gas from Iazi, okay. uh, which you showed in one of your graphs yep. uh, has a sensitivity in the stratosphere. Yep. So how, what, what would your advice be? <laughs> <laughs> so you can see signals. You can definitely see signals, but I wouldn't trust going directly to flux estimation from those signals. So mm. it depends on what you're interested in. I mean, from Iazi, you can do some very interesting work seeing things like biomass burning plumes aloft in this mm -hmm. kind of seasonal cycle and anomalous burning events, this kind of thing, especially in the tropics. Usually the retrievals are a bit more, more trustworthy or so. Um, but to use it directly for flux inversion, I would take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. So, so yeah. more down the modeling route, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, but we can talk about this offline. It's quite interesting. For methane, there's been a little bit more more encouraging results, I would say. Um, but usually you can get best results if you use it in conjunction with near infrared data, so that you have sort of the total column and then the upper tropospheric information simultaneously. And then you can interpret that a little bit, a little bit better. Um, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. <laughs> 
her first name's Cindy, but that doesn't help. Um, she did a, a PhD with um, Philippe Bousquet, and she had a nice paper showing that uh, basically you could show that they were statistically compatible, which was already a good step, yeah? But that there wasn't a lot of additional information available. However, there's another paper in discussion right now from Daniel Jacobs' group showing that if you use thermal infrared and near infrared together for, for constraining methane, you can do a better job of also constraining the OH sink, or at least the interhemispheric di distribution of the OH sink simultaneously. I'm skeptical, but it's interesting. So, yes, I'm sure I'll come and speak to you later. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you.